The American Rehabilitation Educational Network presents Clinical Update, dedicated to meeting the continuing education needs of rehabilitation and healthcare professionals. Clinical Update is a growing series of informative, useful videotape excerpts from Aaron's monthly video conferences. Applying the talents and expertise of distinguished faculty members from around the world, these programs are specifically designed to provide concise, clinically accurate knowledge for use within the daily practice of physical therapists, occupational therapists, nurses, psychologists, speech pathologists, physicians, and other healthcare professionals. This program, Trunk Involvement in Normal Movement, features Isabel Bowman and Jan Utley. In looking at the separation of upper and lower trunk in a normal toned individual, it is important to note that the movements are initiated from the pelvic segment by the movement of the pelvis forward into an anterior tilt and the movement of the pelvis back into a posterior tilt. As the pelvis moves forward, the shoulders align themselves over the hip joints and the head aligns itself over the shoulders. As the pelvis moves back, the shoulders relax and still stay aligned over the hip joints and the head comes forward. This enables an individual to move over their base of support with balance and control. It is important to have this range of movement in the pelvic segment in order to have the quality of movement an individual needs for functional activities. Many patients do not have good separation between the upper and lower trunk due to stiffness and immobility in the pelvic region. Therefore, they tend to overcompensate for this by moving only the shoulders and the head, which greatly disturbs their balance over their base of support. In order to move laterally over the base of support, it is essential to have the pelvis anteriorly tilted. The lateral shift is initiated by shortening on one side of the trunk, followed by elongation on the contralateral side. You will note that as the subject moves laterally, the shoulders tend to stay aligned over the hips, and the head rights itself on the midline with the movement over the base. From behind, with the low back exposed, one can more readily see that the lateral shift is initiated by the muscles of the lower trunk. Again, it is important to see that there is shortening on one side of the trunk with elongation on the contralateral side. Mobility and control in the lower trunk provides for better shoulder girdle separation. The component of shoulder girdle separation is the ability to move the scapula into abduction and slight upward rotation on the thorax. These movement patterns are essential for better use of the upper extremity and functional rotation in the trunk. It is important to remember that functional rotation in the trunk is the sum of all of the basic components of movement previously described. The movement of the pelvis toward an anterior tilt, the lateral tilting of the pelvis, and shoulder girdle separation. Okay, Bo, we're going to turn to you for the final part of our lesson in normal trunk movement, a participatory demonstration. Is it really important for people to feel this? So, so that you really appreciate what we're saying. These are very little changes, but when you feel them, it makes a big difference. Okay, well, we have your demonstration chair all set up here, and we're going to invite our viewers, not just the studio audience here in Pittsburgh, but people all over the country at the viewing sites to get set to, to work along with you. Um, Bo, how do you want everybody to begin? Well, I think they need to take their notebooks and pads and put them on the floor. And make sure you have enough room between your rows so that you can come to standing. And they're going to be sitting in the chair and doing some activities and then standing up. Now, if you'll just come away from the back of the chair, but don't come 
all the way to the edge. Just come away from the back of the chair so that you can slump and not be re resting against the chair. And now I'm going to have you just feel what it's like to sit up and do an erect posture and then slump again. Just get a feel for the amount of work you have to do to do that. And then come to the edge of the chair. So that your thighs are not supported by the chair and just slump again and then come up again. And what you notice is that it's easier to, to come up and do an erect posture when you're closer to the edge. And the reason for that is that your thigh is not supported by the chair so that you don't have all that friction to work against because as you come into an anterior tilt, your femurs move forward. And if they don't, are not supported on the surface, they move forward more easily. <clears throat> now, I know you're going to say to me, yeah, but if you bring patients to the edge of the chair, they're going to be very afraid, and that's true. So we need to give them a better base, and the way we do that is to place their feet. Now, most of you probably have your feet so that your knees are over, the, over your toes or over the balls of your feet. That's fine. Just feel that. I'm going to have you bend forward and feel what that's like. And then come back up. And then put your heels underneath your knees which has widened your base. Now bend forward and feel the difference and how much more stable and secure you feel as you move forward. So that will help the patients become more secure. It's important, though, when you do this to make sure that the feet are flat. So if I have you turn one foot on the side <clears throat> and then bend forward, you'll notice a very distinct difference in the amount of stability and security you have now that that foot is turned on the side. So. When you make, give the patient a better base, you need to be sure that the feet are flat on the floor. <clears throat> now, some of you may have heels on, and it may, for some of the rest of the activities, you may do better if you slip your high heels off. It doesn't matter if you have an inch or two inch heel, but if it gets higher than that, you may be in trouble. <clears throat> now I'd like to have you slump again and come, uh, try to do a lateral shift without coming into an anterior tilt, and you notice that it's difficult to do. If you come into an anterior tilt and then shift laterally, it's easier. So in order to be able to make lateral adjustments in the trunk, you need to be able to come into an anterior tilt. And if you think about your patients, you know that many of them have difficulty doing that, so you know they're going to have difficulty making trunkal adjustments. <clears throat> Now, as you've been slumping and coming up, if those of you that are in the back of the room can see the heads of the people in front of you, those in the front row can't see that much, but as you slump down, you notice that the head tends to move forward. And then as you come up into erect posture, the head tends to realign over the trunk. If you shift laterally, the head tends to tilt and right itself, bringing it back to the midline. And that's why we feel that it's important to establish the trunk because the head will normally write on the trunk. And if you have a patient whose head is tilted and you try to get them to straighten their head up, if the trunk is not in the appropriate posture, it'll be difficult for them to maintain that head position. <clears throat> and now I'm going to have you slump again and raise your arms up horizontally. Now feel the weight of your arms, okay? Now come into an anterior tilt and observe and feel what happens. What you noticed is the arms tended to float up a little bit and they also feel a little lighter in this position. If you didn't, don't feel that much difference, then go back into a slump and feel how much heavier they become when you're down. So it makes a difference with arm ease of movement what position your trunk is in. And I think it's important for you to realize that so that you appreciate why we're saying the trunk is really the base for, for what we do with our limbs. <clears throat> okay, you probably had your feet in a good wide base, which was fine for sitting activities. And you can keep them there because we're going to do one more activity with the arms before we go into uh, some uh, coming to standing. First of all, I want you to shorten your trunk on one side and you can do that either by bringing your shoulder down or bringing your pelvis up and now try to raise your arm on that side 
And you notice it's difficult. It's harder than if your trunk is symmetrical, even though you're in a posterior tilt. If you sag into one side of your hip and then raise your arm, it's also very difficult. So alignment and an erect posture are very critical to making ease of arm movement uh, better. Okay, now place your feet so that the, your knees are over the balls of your feet and that your feet are in line with your hip joints. Now remember your hip joints aren't out here. They're in so that your feet will probably be about four or five inches apart. And you're close, still close to the edge of the surface. I'm just going to have you place your hands on your legs and let your shoulders come forward, but with a rounded back. And come forward far enough so that you think you could probably come to standing at that point. All right, now don't come to stand, but standing, but just feel your legs, OK? Now, keeping your shoulders there, come into an erect posture. In other words, anteriorly tilt so that your back is now straight and feel what happened with your legs when you did that. If you didn't feel a difference, then slump again and feel what happens to your legs. You see how they just become very non-dynamic when you slump. When you anteriorly tilt, they're much more tense, ready to lift you up. So again, the trunk posture is very important when you come to standing. OK, now just sit back again. Now we're going to use all of those components we've talked about. Feet, so that the knees are over the toes or the balls of the feet. <clears throat> your legs with your feet close together. And your knees and hips and feet all in alignment. And your back straight. Now you're going to bend forward and come up slowly. And just feel that. Now I want you to sit down slowly, which means you need to control it. Stay over your base and just fold up. And then stay so that you sit again on the edge of the surface. Now all of you had your hands on your thighs. This time take your hands off and do exactly the same thing you did before. Come forward with a straight back and stand up. You notice it's more difficult. Now, you didn't push with your arms before, but you did use them for balance. And that's an important point to remember, because if you hold the patient's hands up or have them do something else with their hands, then you're taking that away from them when they stand. Now, sit down again. <clears throat> so I'm going to let you use your hands on your thighs as we do some other activities. Now you've had your feet fairly close together. I'm going to have you do that once more and stand up and feel that with your hands on your thighs and then come down again so that you really tune into what that feels like. Now move your feet apart so that you move both feet a couple of inches. Now this is where a lot of patients like to place their feet. So I want you to feel this now, come up to standing. You notice how much more difficult it is. You still can do it, but it's harder. Now, patients do this because, not because they want to make it harder for them to come to stand, but once they're in standing, they feel very insecure with a narrow base. So what we do is to have them have a narrower base, bring them to standing, and then let them use their arms on a support so that they are more stable. OK? Bend down and sit again. <clears throat> and bring your feet back in line with your hip joints. <clears throat> now I'm going to have you continue to use a good erect back. You can continue to have your hands on your legs feet in a good position, but as you come to standing this time, I want the one knee to fall inward just a little, and then just come up. And what did you feel? Where did your weight go? Onto the leg that didn't fall inward, right? So you made that leg work, do double duty, because the other one was out of alignment and no longer usable. OK, 
Okay, sit down again. Now this time, let your leg go out just a little and come up. And the same thing happens. You end up coming up on the leg that stays in alignment. Now sit down again. <clears throat> Now think about if you've had any of your patients, have any of them kept their knee in line with their hip and their foot? Not usually. They either, they either go in or they go out, which means that they're always shifting their weight onto the other leg. And in therapy, we really try to keep that leg in alignment, maintain it so that it stays in alignment with the other leg so that the patient can use it. So that's why we emphasize good alignment because we're not only thinking about where the shoulders are in relation to the pelvis, but also where the hip and the knee and foot are in alignment. Okay. <clears throat> now, this time I'm gonna just have you stand. And <clears throat> stand with a wide base. and just relax and feel. It's real easy to relax in this position. It's called the at ease posture in the service, you know. Now bring your feet back underneath your hip joints so they're about four inches apart. And try and relax as much in this position. First of all, it's more difficult. You are, by demand, because your feet are a little closer together, you're required to do a little bit more to maintain your alignment. But you can still relax a little. Okay, now I'm gonna have you shift your weight to one side until you're not too so far that you totally go out of alignment with your shoulders and hips, but just far enough so that the opposite leg releases. And just feel that. And then I want you to take a step forward. And then come back. Now this time you're gonna do the same thing, but I want you to think about what you feel in your trunk and the leg that you're weight bearing on as you shift your weight and step forward. Okay? Now I want you to get nice and dynamic. Get good alignment. Use your tummy muscles. Stand up nice and tall. Don't, don't elevate your shoulders, but stand up nice and tall. Maintain that, shift your weight, and take a step. You feel a difference? Did you feel, first of all, that you didn't have to shift as much? Yes. You were more stable, you had better control, you didn't go out of alignment. See, when you shift, when you're relaxed, you sort of let your hip go too. When you have a dynamic trunk, you maintain stability, you hold that, and you move over your foot so that your whole body moved more readily over your foot as well. Everybody in the group tended to move their whole body when they stepped the second time. The first time you stepped, the body sort of stayed in one place and you moved your leg. Some people moved, but the greater majority of the people did not move. So to feel that once more, Relax, weight shift. And then step. Now get yourself nice and get step back and then get yourself nice and dynamic. Maintain that shift and take a step. And you can see there's much more of a flow of that movement. So it's important to, it, to have better hip stability. You need to have better, a more dynamic trunk so that you're using your abdominals and your back extensors much more readily. Okay, I'm gonna have you all sit down again. <clears throat> now there's one 
thing that I had I forgot to have you do in coming to standing, so I'm going to have to do that now. Now come close to the edge of the chair again. Get your feet in good alignment. Remember I had you move your legs in and out to feel that. This time I want you to shorten your trunk on one side. You can either shorten it by bringing one shoulder down or one hip up or both and stand up. And you notice how difficult that is. That's the most difficult of any of them, and that's why I wanted to be sure that you felt it. <laughs> OK? Now sit. <clears throat> now, if you think about some of the patients you've worked with, you've seen that. You've seen the leg go out of alignment. And you so that you really know that they're having a lot of these problems. And you also know that you've only done one thing at a time and felt how much more difficult it was. If you add those all together, it really creates a lot of problems. And I wanted you to feel this so that you could experience what good alignment does for you and how much better and easier things are when, when your trunk is in alignment and it's more dynamic and erect when your legs stay in alignment how much easier it is to move over your base or to move your arms. Because I think once you feel this, you will tend to the more when you're working with patients. All of these so-called little things become extremely important for patients when you want them to be successful. And so we attend to every one of these little items to try to help them move with better quality movements and make it easier for them to function. This concludes the clinical update presentation of Trunk Involvement in Normal Movement, which featured Isabel Bowman and Jan Utley. For more information about clinical update or any of Aaron's educational programs, call or write the American Rehabilitation Educational Network. <laughs>